over 25 years ago, on September 29th, 1998, we watched a brainy girl with curly hair drop everything to follow a guy she only kind of knew all the way to college. And so began Felicity. My name is Juliette Littman, and I'm a Felicity super fan. Join me, Amanda Foreman, who you may know better as Megan, the roommate, and Greg Grunberg, who you may also know as Sean Blunberg, as the three of us revisit our favorite moments from the show and talk to the people who help shape it. Listen to Dear Felicity on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. This is Monday Matinee on the Mutual Audio Network. Come on, let's all go to the lobby. Because people are staring at us listening to these shows while we're in the theater. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance recommended. Silver shod horse, pure white, strong as a dozen horses. Listen, I'll open the door. Yeah? Shut up, Steve. Don't you savvy it? If that horse is what I think, we got the most famous horse in the world. How's that? You never hear tell of Silver? Silver? You mean the owner's man? The Lone Ranger, that's what. Listen to that critter kick and howl. Listen here. After I left you, Tonto, I went to the Cummings Ranch. You hear things there? Yes. Silver knew I was there, too. He kicked up quite a fuss. I ain't sent for the Rangers just because you ordered me to. No. I done it simply because I can't locate the horse thieves myself. And I hate horse thieves worse than killers. I'll see the rats hung if I have to send for the hull blamed army. Is it big? It's nationwide. Those three crooks, Joe, Jack, and Jim, have thousands of people all over the country sending money to them. Money that won't bring a thing except false encouragement and heartbreak. Seems to me it's kind of risky using the same tune for half a dozen different songs. Nah, the stuff never amounts to anything. Nobody will ever hear it. What's the difference? I can't think of 150 new tunes every day. You keep the stuff pretty well scattered, though, don't you, Jim? Sure. For example, I'll use that tune, Moonlight Love, on the poem of a guy in New York, one in St. Louis, maybe one in Omaha, one on the West Coast. That saved me writing four different tunes, see? It'd be kind of tough if the fellas ever got together and found they had the same tune. Fat chance of that. And what would happen if one of the songs became a hit? A hit? <laughs> That's a good one, Joe. How can any of this stuff ever be a hit? You take one more load of dog and wolf skins to the storehouse, and then the whole thing can go up in smoke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> those trappers, they'll take it mighty hard. <laughs> good thing you made them sign those contracts. Our agreements will make us rich. We don't pay, though a shipment is made. <laughs> I know there's someone in here. You got a sixth sense, Vance. You go along that wall. I'll take this time. Come out with your hands up. It'll go a lot easier with you. They ain't gonna walk into our arms, Vance. If there is somebody in here, you know that. Welcome to Reimagined Radio, a program about radio storytelling. I'm Jack Armstrong. With each episode, we combine dialogue, sound effects, and music to engage your listening imagination. This episode is no different, and here to tell you about it is John Barber, producer and host. Thank you, Jack. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Reimagined Radio. This episode of Reimagined Radio, Lone Green Challenge, pays tribute to three uniquely connected radio programs that demonstrate high-quality radio storytelling. Each was produced and broadcast by radio station WXYZ, Detroit, Michigan. Each used a handful of voice actors and announcers that cycled between programs starring as wholesome, honest, larger-than-life characters. Each was packaged with operatic overtures. Each was intended for young audiences, but gained an adult following and today is among the best old-time radio programs. What are these radio programs? Our episode title is a big hint. And here is another. Horse with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty Hyo Silver, the Lone Ranger. No doubt you recognize the Lone Ranger from its theme music, 
The William Tell Overture. This music was written by Giacchino Rossini as the overture for his 1829 opera, William Tell. George W. Trindle, owner of WXYZ Radio, felt that young listeners would benefit from exposure to classical music and so adopted the William Tell Overture as the musical theme for his new radio program, The Lone Ranger. From 1933 to 1955, radio listeners enjoyed 2,956 episodes of The Lone Ranger. Let's listen now to Horse Thieves Steal Silver, first broadcast February 2, 1938, and the earliest known surviving episode of The Lone Ranger. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse Silver, and once again we hear the inspiring cry. Hey, oh! The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, old boy. Tell who's waiting for us in the cafe near Abilene. We must hurry, old fellow. Hurry, old silver. Hurry. Over a period of time, many high-bred horses had disappeared from ranches in the neighborhood of Abilene. No one had been able to trace them nor to discover the thieves. At last, Cal Cummings, most prominent of the ranchers, directed the sheriff to ask the help of the Texas Rangers. A letter was written and addressed to Ranger Headquarters and entrusted to the care of one of the townspeople of Abilene for delivery. Zeke Skinner had been spending his money too freely for drink, and as the evening progressed, he talked more than was wise. And when he staggered from the cafe, he was halted by the threat of a heavy gun and the stern voice of the Lone Ranger. Stand where you are, Skinner. Well, what does this mean? Go through his pockets, Tonto, and find that paper he was talking about this evening. Me get him. Can a man just talk? Did you find the paper, Tonto? Me got paper here. Let me see it. That's my property. You can't... This is what we want, Tonto. Hip! Get to the saddle. Me me ready. Now for Abilene. Hail Silver! One evening, several days after the masked man took the paper from Zeke Skinner... Cal Cummings stood at the Abilene bar with the sheriff. Tell you, sheriff, there just ain't no way to account for this horse thief that's been working around here. It's got me beat, Cal. That's why I was willing to send for rangers. I know when I'm again something I can't savvy. Oh, you're a smart hombre, sheriff. I reckon you savvy that men in my position won't tolerate the loss of high-bred horses for very long. Don't get wrong notions, Cummings. I ain't sent for the rangers just because you ordered me to. No? I done it simply because I can't locate the horse thieves myself. And I hate horse thieves worse than killers. I'll see the rats hung if I have to send for the whole blamed army. You reckon, Sheriff, I'll change my mind about buying a drink? I figured me and you understood each other. I buy my own drinks. Then I don't owe nothing to no one. Well, I'll join my tap hand over yonder. Someday, Steve, I'll take some of that high-handed way out of that sheriff. Yeah, I'm with you, Cummins. How are things fixed for tonight? All set. The boys have got that big white horse spotted at the hitch rack again. Good. Found the man that owns him yet? No, but it's true that he goes masked. He's a hard man to locate, though. Well, he must be close by if the horse is here. What about the other horse? He's the masked man's partner. Darn curious. They hitch the horses outside and then don't show up nowhere. Yeah, that makes stealing the big horse risky. You don't know where they'll come from. Everything is set, though, ain't it? Yeah, if only the plans work out. We'll get the high sign in a few moments. In spite of the way Cummings had spoken to the sheriff, he himself was the leader of the thieves. Silver, the Lone Ranger's horse, seemed to him a splendid prize, and Cummings' men were given orders to steal it. Silver put up a terrific battle as the crooks dragged him from the hitch rack. The masked man and Tonto were at the rear of the cafe watching Cal Cummings when they heard the commotion at the front. Tonto, that's Silver. What? They're taking Silver away. If only I could shoot to kill. I'll take your horse. You take the other. We'll get after those thieves. Uh, All right, stranger. Price them. We got you covered. Put down those guns. My horse is stolen. Keep your hands high or we shoot. Don't take no risks, mister. We're Texas Rangers. You? That's right. We're here to get the horse thieves. And it looks like we got them. What's going on here? What's all the noise? Them's the Texas Rangers. We've seen this mask, hombre, taking horses. 
sent to mount one with a CC brand. Well, that's my horse. My own horse has been stolen. We were borrowing a horse to get after the thieves. Tell that to the jury. We got them covered. Gosh, it don't take you gents long to make an arrest. Oh, you're the sheriff, huh? Yep, my jail's at your disposal. I'll help you lock them up. Maybe they'll tell where the other mounts is hid. Gahula! Yes, Tonto. What's that? Ohlal Tula. Chu Talu. That's all we can do, Kimo Sabi. Hey, cut that chatter and engine. You're under arrest. Now, Tonto. Now we got him. Go. Blast him. Come on, my fellow. He got loose. Get Shoot get him. him. Get this bitch, Kim. Off me. He got us off guard. Get your gun. Come on. Well, we got him anyhow. Huh? You got me. That all right. You'll pay for this. Thought you were slick to jump us and spill the lot of us. You let the masked man get away. Now take it easy. We'll corral him later on. The main thing is we got one of the horse thieves. We ought to drill him on the spot. No, don't do that. Take him to jail. Make him tell all he knows. Keep him there till he gets hung. The Lone Ranger had made his escape for two reasons. He knew that as long as he was held in jail, he could not recover silver. And once captured, the mask that concealed his identity would be taken from his face. While Tonto kept the sheriff, Cummings, and the other two men busy, the masked man fled on Tonto's horse. Some hours later that same night, we find the two men, Ben and Dave, in Cal Cummings' ranch house. Me and Dave hung around town for a while, Cummings. Then we come out here. Yeah, it was Ben's idea to see what the talk in town was. What is the talk? <laughs> it was sure lucky break for us catching him hands down like that. Trying to steal my horse. That was done on purpose. The boys left that one of yours where they got the big wagon from, figuring the masked man would ride it. It didn't happen like we figured. But it worked out all right. Kale, it was sure a slick scheme, making everyone, including the sheriff, think we was Texas Rangers. We got you <laughs> boys here without rousing suspicion. It sure did. Wonder what the sheriff say if he knowed about his letter to the governor asking for Texas Rangers. Oh, well, what did you do with it? I give Zeke his orders on it and paid him off. Think he's likely to come back? No, not him. Now then, boys, let's get down to some planning. Well? I got a half a dozen other horses lined up to take. All good ones? The finest. Just give us the orders, that's all. I got an idea. Let's hear it, Cal. We got to start lynch talk. Lynch him? Is that what you mean? That wouldn't work out for your plan. You can't lynch him. Oh, he won't get lynched. We'll get a mob riled, though. Then when he gets out, he'll travel fast. I don't expect the sheriff will take to lynching. Well, I'll have one of the boys keep him in tow away from the jail. Steve can rile the lynch mob. That sounds like a good scheme, eh? Hey, Cummins. Now, Steve. Oh, that white horse is a devil on four legs. I can't handle the critter at all. Where's he at? The stable. It was all quiet and calm. Then all of a sudden... Well? Gosh, I wish you'd seen it. Them ears poked forward and the head come up, and then it started in raising particular Ned. Biting, pawing, kicking, and I don't know what now. Gosh, it's a powerful critter. That ain't all. I've seen them shoes it's wearing, and boss, i never seen none like them before. How's that? I'd stake my life on it. They're solid silver. Silver? Wait. Leaping buzzards. Silver shod horse. Pure white, strong as a dozen horses. Listen, I'll open the door. Yeah? Shut up, Steve. Don't you savvy it? If that horse is what I think, we got the most famous horse in the world. How's that? You never hear tell of silver? Silver? You mean the owner's man? The Lone Ranger, that's what. Listen to that critter kick and howl. Listen here. If that's the Lone Ranger, he wouldn't ride away from here. He wouldn't leave that horse. The horse was quiet till a while back, and then he started in. And that means it's masters around here, Summers. Get all the boys out. Have them scour this ranch for the masked man. I'll go get him. Throw a guard around the stable. I will. Give orders if that man seen to shoot him on sight. Come on. You too, Dave. Right. The chance of a lifetime. Boys, we got the famous silver and never known it. We're going to do big things with him. <laughs> Horse is quiet now. Reckon the masked man ain't been here after all. I'll drat the luck. I hope to get a shot at him. So do I. Just as well. If he had been here, he might have heard our plans. And that had spoiled everything. Yeah. What are we going to do? Stay on guard in the saddle all night? Uh, you boys can sleep. You got a busy day tomorrow. I'll see if the stable's guarded. Tomorrow, we got to pose as rangers and... 
<laughs> we didn't take another lot of horses with us when we leave here to hunt the horse thieves. The following day, the Lone Ranger removed his mask and cleverly disguised himself to look like a rancher. Then he entered the sheriff's office where Tonto was held. The sheriff, seated at his desk, looked up at the Lone Ranger's approach. You're a stranger around here, mister. Where are you from? You have a prisoner here, Sheriff. I'd like to have a look at him. For what? I think he might be a man I saw near the box K spread. That door at the rear is the door to the jail room. You can speak to the prisoner between the bars. After I've talked to him, I'll be able to tell you whether or not he's the man we suspect. It don't matter anyhow. He's sure to hang as soon as he gets tried in court. I'll speak to him. Kimosabe. Mm, me know you come. Tonto, I've learned the entire plan. Uh -huh. We weren't sure of our facts until last night, when those men who called themselves Texas Rangers pulled their guns to cover us. After I left you, Tonto, I went to the Cummings Ranch. You hear things there? Yes. Silver knew I was there, too. He kicked up quite a fuss. Color think you there? Yes, they did. I had to leave, Silver. If I'd taken him, the horse thieves would have known I'd overheard their plans and they would have changed them. Uh. As it stands now, they'll go through with their idea. And it'll give us a chance to prove to everyone that they're crooks. I'll try to get Silver after the men have left the Cummings Ranch tonight, Toto. Then I'll come back here. Meantime... Two men will come to let you out of jail. What Tonto do? Take this gun. Hide it in your shirt and listen carefully to what I tell you. Cummings and his scheming companions left the ranch that night, planning to rouse the townspeople against Tonto. As they disappeared from sight, the masked man, silent as a shadow, raced across the open plain to the stable. A moment later, a thunder of hoofs and silver with a lone ranger in the saddle sped into the night. Meanwhile, Cummings, Dave, and Ben took cover behind a dark row of buildings near the jail. Their Confederate Steve was busily playing his part to excite the mob against Tonto. I tell you, boys, it's worth trying. Yes. What do you say? We get on this. He's working them along in great shape, ain't he, boys? Head bunch is all set to start out any minute now. We'd better be set ourselves. Let's get on our horses. Yeah. Yep. As soon as they start moving to the jail, you boys get on the jump. What about the sheriff? I locate him and stay with him. Come on, boys. We'll take the jail by storm. Who's got him, Ruth? That's it. Bring it up here. Bring it up here. The mob of townspeople, raised to a pitch of fury by Steve's speeches, headed for the jail. Cummings left to find the sheriff and keep him from interfering. At the same time, Dave and Ben rode swiftly to the rear of the jail to play their part in the plot engineered by their leader. Hey, let me get this bar in the lock. I'll pry it open. <laughs> Who are you, fella? We're the men that put you here. Texas Ranger. Huh? That's who we are. We put you here for trial, not to get lynched. We got a horse waiting for you right over yonder. Get aboard it and travel fast. You let me go away? We don't let no man face a lynch mob. Me not go. What are you talking about, you crazy galoot? Don't you hear the men coming here to string you up? Let me hear them. Then get moving. You're free now. Run. Not so fast. What the sham here? The mask You coming. Me got him gunned, too. What the... Get into that jail. Uh, you, both of you. Me show them you. you. The mob's at the other door right now. You can't do this. We're Texas Rangers. Uh, you wait. All right, go ahead, boy. It's us. Listen. The two Rangers. Uh, what are you doing in there? Get them two wait. behind us. A masked man. That's... They busted the other door. Stand back. Get back there, all of you. If there's a man among you dares draw a gun now, let him try it. I'll shoot you! I'll shoot the gun from anybody else who tries that. My hand! Where's your horse thief, boys? Get him! Wait! There are horse thieves here, and you'll have them in just a moment. Sheriff, these two men are no more Texas Rangers than you are. That? They're two of the thieves who've been working around here. Those are the men who have been taking the horses from the Cummings Ranch and selling them. Where's Cal Cummings? There he is, trying to get away. Come back here, Cummings! Get through here! the man with them guns is telling the true yeah. facts. Maybe these are the critters that's been taking horses from your spread after all. Not Cal Cummings' horses. They take the horses which Cummings and Steve and other C.C. Waddies have been stealing from all of you. Those animals go first to Cummings' place. Oh, that ain't true. Wait he a got... minute. Cummings, you persuaded the sheriff to send for Texas Rangers, didn't you? Well, I... You gotta admit that much, Cal. Yes, I did. No Texas Rangers came here. Because you paid the man who was supposed to take the sheriff's letter to stay away from here and not deliver the letter. You did that so you could bring in those two friends of yours. 
and have them pose as rangers to frame someone in town for horse stealing. Keep talking, stranger. You got any proof of what you say? I have the letter you wrote, Sheriff. Here it is. It was never delivered. You can find Zeke Skinner if you want to. He'll tell you how much Cal Cummings paid him and how he lost it in a gambling place on the outskirts of Abilene. There ain't a word of truth in what he says. You want more proof? You got more proof, stranger? Go to Cummings' place right now. You'll find the horses that were taken away from here tonight. Horses stolen from you. You'll also find letters from the men who bought the stolen horses telling Cummings to get more of the same kind. Hi, uh, Thunder. All you gotta do is look at Cummings' face to know the masked man tells the truth. Boys, wait. Listen. Don't rip me. I got a right to a trial. You'll Don't. get a trial, all right. And so all these crook parts are yours. Boys, tie them up. You two deputies stand guard till we get the jail doors fixed. Yeah, Come on, Tonto. Let's get out of here. Yeah, we'll... Together again, Silver, old boy. Come, Tonto. We're riding. Hi, You are listening to Reimagined Radio. Our episode, Lone Green Challenge, is a tribute to three radio series produced and broadcast by WXYZ Detroit, Michigan, 1930s to 1950s. You just listened to Horse Thieves Steal Silver, the earliest known surviving episode of The Lone Ranger. Earl Grazier voiced the part of The Lone Ranger. John Todd was Tonto. We'll listen to the second program in our tribute in just a moment. This is John Barber, producer and host of Reimagined Radio. We partner with other radio programs, producers, and actors to bring you a variety of radio storytelling. One example is The Fusebox Show. Freeform but focused, appropriate for all age groups and audiences, Fusebox shares observations and reactions to events that both stir our imagination and boil our blood. Here's a sample. Fusebox. Yeah, I think it's time to drop the mental health hammer on old Louie. <laughs> if she drowns, she's not a witch. It has to do with the revealing of a soon-to-be-born infant. And that involves setting something on fire? Fusebox. Learn more at the Fusebox Show website, www.thefuseboxshow.com. This is Reimagined Radio, and we are paying tribute to three radio programs produced and broadcast by WXYZ Detroit, Michigan. You just listened to Horse Thieves Steal Silver, the earliest known surviving episode of The Lone Ranger. Here is a hint about the second radio program in our tribute. the biggest of all game, public enemies that even the G-men cannot reach, the Green Hornet. After successfully establishing the Lone Ranger series, WXYZ Radio began producing and broadcasting the Green Hornet. The series ran from 1938 to 1952. Like the Lone Ranger, the Green Hornet began with an operatic overture, in this case, The Flight of the Bumblebee, composed 1899 to 1900, by Nikolai Rimsky korsakov for his opera, The Tale of Tsar Sultan. Let's listen to Words and Music, the May 30, 1939 episode of The Green Hornet. Let successful radio, talking, and recording artists show you the glamorous road to fame and fortune. Write the words and music for a song hit. Let the three J's, Joe, Jack, and Jim, do the rest. We publish and distribute. We guarantee to put your song in the hands of leading movie producers, orchestras, and radio stations. Get out of the rut. Write a song. Yeah. How's that sound for an ad? Joe, you ought to quit music publishing and go in for ad writing. That'll get them. Sounds good, Joe. But you ought to have something about uh, send for our free booklet and full details. Oh, I got that here. Right down at the bottom. 
Now, the idea is that we'll run this in all the cheap magazines with a blank to be sent in. We've fiddled around with this racket long enough. Now it's time to branch out. That's the idea. Get into a nationwide business. Hold on, Jack. Hmm? Maybe we should get a lawyer to look things over. We'll be using the mails, you know. I talk to the lawyer, Jim. We aren't breaking any laws. What about that line, submitting songs to radio stations, dance bands, and all that? We will. We'll submit them. If they toss them in the wastebasket, that's not our worry. Okay. Another thing the lawyer said. What's that? We ought to protect each other. I got some contracts here, see? Contracts for what? We all sign them. It's a partnership agreement so we don't break up. Break up? Yeah. Suppose one of us finds a job with a radio sponsor or something. None of us could. You know that, Jake. We worked as a harmony trio. We're washed up as far as that stuff goes. Maybe your pipes were never good for solo stuff, but Jim can do a good tenor. Oh, not me. I'm with a publishing racket. There's big dough in it. And we don't have to worry about commercial contracts running out. Just the same. We should have an agreement. If one of us pulls out or dies, the other two get his share of the work. That's fair enough, Jake. Sounds all right to me. I thought it'd be okay with you two. If we're going into big business, we might as well be organized right. And what about this ad? Is it okay with you two to go ahead and run it? Sure. The sooner we get started, the sooner the dough will begin rolling in. The advertising for the three J's was widely circulated throughout the country. And a few weeks later, cash came pouring into the publisher's office with every mail delivery. Hundreds of hopeful young people awaited the verdict of the racketeer trio, just as Waldo Fielding did. Any mail for me today, Mother? Uh, yes, Waldo. There's a letter from that song publisher. Where is it? Gee, I can hardly wait to hear what they say about my poem. Wouldn't it be swell if they put music to it and publish? Uh, there's the letter, Walt. Ma! What is it, Walt? They'll accept my poem. They will? Yeah, they like it. They'll have one of their best men write the tune, and then they'll publish it and see that it goes to all the radio stations and the movie studios and the dance band. Oh, boy, I knew I could do it. But, Waldo, won't they expect a lot of money for doing all that? No. They say here that they'll take the chance on royalties. If I don't make anything, they won't make anything either. All I have to do is pay for the copyright and the printing cost and mailing. But how much is that? It's about $50. $50? But that's not much, really. Well, I'll bet a lawyer would charge almost that much just to get the copyright for me. And it might bring me in as much as half a million dollars. But, Waldo, $50, we haven't got that well, I'll get it. I'll sell my camera, and I can get something for my banjo. The chances are that Steve will pay a little for my shotgun. I'll get the money. Don't you worry about it, Ma. You just wait. I'll be rich one of these days. I'm going to start on another song poem right away. Several more weeks elapsed. Joe, Jack, and Jim found a veritable gold mine in their venture. They expanded in their advertising, moved into larger offices. And then one day... Hey, Joe. Jack. Yeah, Jim? The better business people have been checking up. So what? They don't like our way of doing business. Oh, they don't, huh? Well, isn't that too bad? What are they going to do about it? They'll probably publish some warnings about us. Ah, the suckers that send lyrics and tunes to us won't listen to warnings. They're so convinced that their stuff is good, they'll believe whatever they want to believe. That's the psychology of this business. Well, just passing on what that bird from the business bureau told me. He claimed we're running a racket. It isn't a racket at all. We take a certain fee for publishing a song, agree to secure a copyright, furnish a tune, a lyric, whichever is required, and have a certain number of copies printed and distributed. And we do all those things. Certainly. We fulfill our part of the contract to the letter. There isn't a law in the country that can touch us. But it won't do us any good to have newspaper ads calling attention to our way of doing business. Well, we can't stop it, can we? Well, I thought if it was agreeable to you two, I'd uh, make a few promises and stall things off for a while. We're really just getting a foothold. An ad in a paper in one city isn't going to hurt us much. Our business is nationwide. Let them advertise. Can't hurt us. Okay, Jack, it's up to you. And Joe? I agree with Jack. Now, uh, what about the tunes for this batch of stuff that came in today? You got it all sorted according to meter, haven't you? Yeah. Okay, then let's have it. I'll wrap out a few little jingles and give them some music. Seems to me it's kind of risky using the same tune for half a dozen different songs. Nah, the stuff never amounts to anything. Nobody will ever hear it. What's the difference? I can't think of 150 new tunes every day. You keep the stuff pretty well scattered, though, don't you, Jim? Sure. For example, I'll use that tune, Moonlight Love, on the poem of a guy in New York, one in St. Louis, maybe one in Omaha, one on the West Coast. That saved me writing four different tunes, see? It'd be kind of tough if the fellas ever got together and found they had the same tune. Fat chance of that. And what would happen if one of the songs became a hit? A hit? <laughs> That's a good one, Joe. How can any of this stuff ever be a hit? We'll see to it that it isn't. Ed Lowry, the star reporter of the Daily Sentinel, came into the office of the young publisher, Britt Reed, a couple of hours later. 
Miss Case, Reed's secretary, said... Mr. Reed's not in now, Laura. But I gotta see him about a special story. He's still out. Where? How the dickens do I know where he goes? I'm the last one he tells. It's discouraging. Discouraging? Hey, now listen, Casey. Don't get ideas that the boss is interested in you. He travels with the 400. Don't be idiotic. As far as Britt Reed is concerned, you're just part of the office furniture. But I do wish he'd settle down long enough so I could write to his father with some feeling of confidence. Now, what's the trouble? Oh, just as soon as I write Mr. Reed and tell him that Britt's taking an interest in the Daily Sentinel, he, he disappears. <laughs> Lady, if I had his dough, I'd never come to the office. During the past week, he's been out to some affair almost every night. He's bored with the office again. Well, he'll get his fill of nightlife and then settle down again. Yes, until he gets his fill of the newspaper business again. Oh, here he is. Say, boss, I ran into Doyle, the big cop, today. Oh, yes? And he had a kid in tow. But when Doyle spotted him first, he was trying to peddle a song he'd written. A song? And it ties right in with the racket we've been working on. Uh, what racket was that, Larry? Music publishing. You know, those wildcat publishers that call themselves Joe, Jack, and Jim, the three J's? Who are they? A uh, broken-down vocal trio that hit a good racket. I got a first-hand story from one of the victims of the racket. The poor kid got just enough encouragement from them to quit his job and leave home. Here, here's the song he wrote. I brought a copy for you. Well, leave it with Miss Case. I'll take it with me when I go home. Well, what about my story? I got pictures of the kid. Well, speak to the city editor about it. He's paid to handle that sort of thing. But maybe there's editorial meat in it. Gunnigan is the best judge for that. Oh, hang it all. That's the matter, Larry. Well, look here, boss. Take I got to Gunnigan, Larry. Okay, okay. I'll take it to Gunnigan. There's the words and music. Mr. Reed. Yes, Miss Case? <laughs> I'm going to stick my neck out again. Then why can't... <laughs> Why won't you... Oh, I understand, Miss Case. You're concerned again because I'm spending too little time around here. Frankly, I am, Mr. Reed. You'll have to admit the newspaper work hasn't a great deal of adventure. There was plenty of excitement while the Green Hornet was so active. Uh, there was, wasn't there? I wonder if the Hornet has been killed. Killed? Well, why, Miss Case? We haven't had a story about a Hornet adventure in quite a while. Well, that's true. He may have been killed or he may have... Well, retired. Mm, I doubt if the Green Hornet would retire, Miss Case. Well, perhaps then the police and public have been so greatly aroused that the Hornet doesn't risk making another appearance. That's quite possible. I never saw you more interested in the newspaper than while the Green Hornet was running wild. Well, you must admit the Green Hornet furnished news. He certainly did. Mr. Reed, there's just as much excitement in everyday life if you could only realize it. For example? For example, that lad that Lowry tried to tell you about. Waldo Fielding. But there's human interest. Poor chap that falls for racketeers, quits his job in the little home community, comes to the big city, goes hungry, is misled and victimized by these fake music publishers. Isn't there something the law can do about publishers of that sort? If there were, the law would be doing it. But they stay inside the law, Mr. Reed. According to Lowry, they have a contract, and they fulfill the terms of the contract. So the law is helpless. Yeah, I've heard about the racket, Miss Case. Aren't you going into your office? No, no, I think I'll leave for the day. It's after four. But, Mr. I'll Reed... I'll take along with me just to satisfy Lauren. Very well. See you sometime tomorrow. You will stop in then tomorrow. Oh, yes, I'll probably stop in. The Green Hornet would only start up again, and perhaps Britt Reed would become interested in the publication of news. <laughs> Reed went directly from his office to his apartment. He was uneasy and restless, and only Cato, his faithful valet, realized the real cause of the uneasiness. You're right, Cato. I do feel handcuffed, hampered, tied down. If there only some way the Hornet could get at this music publishing racket, I'd go off. But there is, Mr. Baird. A risk be confounded. There's a risk in anything, Cato. Yes, Mr. Baird. I can't find any way it can be broken up. Not even if we do use the role of the Green Hornet to get at them. Is it big? It's nationwide. Those three crooks, Joe, Jack, and Jim, have thousands of people all over the country sending money to them. Money that won't bring a thing except false encouragement and heartbreak. Yes, sir. Yeah, look at tonight's Sentinel. Look at that warning from the Better Business Barrel. They wanted to buy a few inches. I gave them a quarter of a page. But do you think that'll stop people from being made victims? Not on your life. I even ran one of the songs, a typical song, copyrighted and published by Joe, Jack, and Jim. To show the stuff they call good. Cato. Why haven't it just occurred to me? What is it? The yeah, ad for the business bureau, Cato. It shows a typical song published by that firm of Joe, Jack, and Jim. Yes, Mr. And Reed. the music for this is the same tune that was used by that young chap Lowry brought in a story about. It is. It definitely is. I don't know a great deal about music, but I do know that much. This may give me the lead I need to smash that publishing firm. 
Joe, Jack, and Jim. Well, we'll see if they're staying within the law. Well, what can you do? Do? Go to the office. I want to look around there for a while. And if my suspicions are correct, we'll hold a meeting of the firm. The firm? Joe, Jack, and Jim. Come on. We're taking out the Black Beauty. Britt Reed went through a secret panel in the rear of his clothes press. And then by means of a passage between the walls of the apartment building, he reached a small door that opened into the loft of an old, supposedly abandoned livery stable. It was here, unknown to everyone, that the sleek black car of the Green Hornet was housed. Is the car ready, Cato? Yes, sir. All right, get in. I want to telephone Joe, Jack, and Jim, but I can do that from their own office later on this evening. Yes, sir. Now, let's get going. There's the night watchman, Cato. Standing at the entrance to the building. Yes, sir. You take the car onto the rear. I'll handle him. Hat brim pulled low over his eyes, almost hiding the mask. The green hornet approached the entrance of the office building where a man stood smoking a pipe. Offices are all closed now, mister. I, uh... I don't want to hurt you. <coughs> what have you done, hornet? That'll hold you for an hour. If I need more time, I'll give you some more gas. Dragging the unconscious form of the watchman inside the building... The Green Hornet left him in a corner, then ran the elevator to the 10th floor. Half an hour later, the three Jays had a phone call at their apartment. I suppose that's just another one of these would-be writers calling for information on his song hit. Answer, Jack. Hello. Oh, I wish we'd given that feeling kid little dough. Oh, stop harping about him, Jim. Yeah. Oh, passing out in the street like he did. Hunger. That won't do us any good. Well, it won't hurt us any. Yeah? That'll be swell. Who's he got on the phone? I don't know. Looks as if it's something pretty good. Yes, sir. Right away. Hey, fellas, we're set to really go places. Who is that? A publisher. Publisher? Magazine publisher. One of those cheap picture mags. He's in town for the evening and wants to talk to us about running a picture story of our business. Yeah? Hey, that would be swell publicity. Wouldn't it, though? That'll offset what the Sentinel Light has done. Won't offset it. It's a national magazine. When do you see him? Right away. He asked if I couldn't meet him in our office tonight. Tonight? Yeah, and let him see what sort of picture story could be run. Good, we'll go with you. Yeah, come on, let's start. This is the break of a lifetime. Joe, Jack, and Jim rushed in a cab to their office building and found the front door open. Didn't leave the front door open like that. Don't worry about it. Yeah, that'll save us waiting for the elevator. Well, there you are. covered. What in place? Mass. The Green Hornet. Get in there or I'll fold you up where the night watchman is. You killed him. Murder. Get aboard. Don't shoot. Don't shoot. Well, what are you after? Stop to your office. Get going now. The tenth floor, you know. Stop waving that gun around. I'll stop by letting you have it at the first sign of any rough stuff. I'll show you. Go, Jim. <laughs> let that warn you two. Oh, shot him in cold blood. Yeah. How do you like it? Leave him right where he is. You open that door and get to your office. What are you going to do? You'll find us. I have keys. You won't need them. I've unlocked the door and everything else that needs unlocking. Now what? Sit down at that desk. What do you want? Money, lots of money. There's your checkbook. I have to notice your bank balance there. You can write a lot of checks. Checks? I said checks. For who? Make out the first to Harvey Dale. D-A-L-E. According to your records, he's paid in $150. That's the amount you sent him. Go on now. Start writing. Now you see here. Right. How far are you going? As far as your bank balance will allow. I'll be broke. I can't afford all that. You can't afford not to pay up. You'll afford it a whole lot better than these people contributed to your success. If you don't cover those checks, you'll mighty soon find yourself not only in court, but eventually in jail. Take your choice, Rat. Go broke and stay free, and go broke and go to jail. And make out checks until you get the writer's cramp. And say that those checks clear the bank. Wait, if we don't stop payment, if those checks go through... Then you'll have nothing but poverty to worry you. And don't try another racket like this one. Leaving the two racketeers in their office, the Hornet took the elevator to the first floor, dragged the still unconscious man to the rear door of the building, and put him into the car. Yeah, that'll do, Cato. What do we do with him? We'll have to keep him under cover and at least checks clear the bank. And then, Cato, we can let him go. Central Pepper! Green Hornet mail check! Exclusive Green Hornet story! Green Hornet not large!
This is Lone Green Challenge, an episode of Reimagined Radio. You just listened to Words and Music, the May 30, 1939 episode of The Green Hornet. Albert Hodge voiced the part of The Green Hornet. Roland Parker was Cato. This is John Barber. I'll be right back with our third program in just a moment. Excellent radio series like The Lone Ranger and The Green Hornet showcase skilled use of spoken voice, sounds, music, and imagination. Upcoming episodes of Reimagined Radio will follow this lead. We plan a Columbia Workshop tribute, a look at four radio stories that may have inspired the War of the Worlds, and more. Please join us as we share these interesting stories. You are listening to Lone Green Challenge, an episode of Reimagined Radio that pays tribute to three radio programs produced and broadcast by WXYZ Detroit, Michigan. You have listened to The Lone Ranger and The Green Hornet. Here is a hint about our third program. The swiftest, strongest of Eskimo lead dogs blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. The third program in our tribute is the challenge of the Yukon. Like the Lone Ranger and the Green Hornet, the challenge of the Yukon uses an operatic overture as its musical theme. In this case, it's the overture to Emil von Resnikek's comedic opera, Dona Diana first performed in 1894. Let's listen to Meeting the Terms of a Contract, first broadcast May 28, 1943, the earliest known surviving episode of The Challenge of the Yukon. It was early afternoon, and Sergeant Preston was on patrol duty in the Yukon with his lead dog, the Great King. What is it, King? All right, King, you lead the way. Hmm. He's going after something, but I can't make out what it is. He's following a scent. It'll be a good idea to see what it leads to. Hmm. All right, boy, I'm coming. That cave over there? Is that where you're going, King? Well, King, you've never been wrong before. Whatever's in that cave must be pretty important. Hmm. Someone uses this cave. But what for? Now look at these pelts. Fox, lynx, beaver. Why, they're beautiful. Trapper uses this cave for a storeroom has certainly got a fortune in furs. Well, this cave is full of pelts. Yes, King? What's over there now? Oh, I see. So this is what had you so excited, boy. Now, what would any trapper with these rich skins be doing with dog and wolf pelts? I can understand a trapper building up a supply of high-grade pelts, but... Why would he keep so many of these worthless ones? What is it, boy? Hmm? Someone coming? Yes, King. There's something wrong here. We can't get out without being discovered. We'll get back at the far end of the cave. Ah, uh, here. We should be safe here. Well, this is another bunch we'll catch you now. Eh, that's the last of them, thank heaven. I'm so tired hauling these pelts. The Holland's just... almost over now. You take one more load of dog and wolf skins to the storehouse, and then the whole thing can go up in smoke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> those trappers, they'll take it mighty hard. It's a good thing you made them sign those contracts. Our agreements will make us rich. We don't pay, though a shipment is made. <laughs> that contract was the smartest thing you ever put together, Van. I didn't have much to do with any law, but I can draw up a watertight contract. And there's not a thing any of those trappers can do to break their agreements. Just look at that beaver skin. It's a beauty. Yeah, it's a beauty, all right. Uh, these skins will bring a fortune. Yeah? 
What do you have a gold mine in the fur business? All them trappers need is to hear the prices we pay for the skins, and they're bringing the best ones to us in carloads. The best part of it is we pay when shipment's made, <laughs> and we never ship. Yeah, we can't tote these wolf and dog skins to the warehouse till dark, Vance. No, we might as well stay right here till sundown. Yeah, I'll start a fire. Wait a minute. Leave that firewood alone. Let me listen. What's eating you, Vance? There's someone in this cave. Oh, who could be? There's in? someone in here, I tell you. Listen, Vance, there ain't a soul knows about this cave. Well, we can look around just to make sure if it'll make you feel any better. It's no joke, Duval. I know there's someone in here. You got a sixth sense, Vance. You go along that wall. I'll take this time. Come out with your hands up. It'll go a lot easier with you. They ain't gonna walk into our arms, Vance. If there is somebody in here, you know that. That's a warning. Come out with your hands up. You shot loose in some rocks. Oh. Hey, what the? I told you there was somebody in here. Now bring that light over. I've got a gun and I'm going to use it. Jumping horn toads of Mountie. Well, I never expected to meet Sergeant Preston knocked out by a couple of falling rocks. Come on, Duval. We'll tie him up before he regains consciousness. Uh, here's some of that rope we used to tie the pelts together. That'll be all right. <laughs> if that mutt moves, shoot him. Oh. There, that does it. We had a hard time getting free of these ropes. Oh, my head. Oh, I must have... Shut up, you mutt. King, old fellow. We've got to do something about this mount event. You heard us talking. Don't worry. We'll take care of him. Oh. Shoot that mutt, Duval. Quiet, King. Call him out here. All right, King. Come on out, boy. Shoot him, Duval. Oh, now, Vance. You heard me. Are you going to shoot him, or will I? Make a break for King. Go on, boy. I'll get him. No, you won't, Vance. You're not going to kill King. Go ahead. Shoot, Duval. Uh, it's no use, Vance. He's clean away. Uh, if you'd have shot him when I told you. King. Hey, King, is that the dog? Yeah, that... that's the smartest lead dog in the Yukon. And now he's going to bring help, thanks to you. Oh, we better get rid of this mouthy fast, then, Vance. Sure. Fine. Have you got any ideas? Well, put a couple of bullets in him right now. You should have thought of that when the dog was here. No, it's suicide to kill a Marty. You'll never get away with this. Listen, Preston. This is one time you're not holding the gun. You'll die all right, but without bullet marks on you. You can't win, Vance. Sometime and soon, the inspector will send one of the other Marty's to see what's happened. Let him. By that time, Duval and me will be so far out of the Yukon, your law will never catch up with us. Now don't worry, when you're found, Preston, it's not going to look like murder. What do you aim to do with him, Vance? We'll gag him and take him for a walk. You mean... Yes. We'll have to go ahead with our plans tonight. We can't waste any time. That dog will have someone back here in a few hours. You're right. Let's pack up these furs and get moving. He was downright obedient. <laughs> Throw him down on top of some of those worthless pelts, then tie his feet. All right, Mounty. <clears throat> you won't be able to move when I finish tying this. <clears throat> we'll put a lot of these dog skins around him. <clears throat> you figure he's... We want Sergeant Preston's death in the fire to look real. And we want to be sure there's not a chance for him to get out alive. I get you, Vance. That way you can say he was caught trying to save someone from the burning warehouse, huh? Good idea. Come on, Duval. We'll put some of this oil around. That ought to be enough, Vance. Yeah, that'll do it. Now I'll take this lamp. Yeah, those skins burn plenty fast. This place will be an inferno in five minutes. Less than that. Come on, let's get out of here. I don't want to be too close to this place when the fire is discovered. Attracted first by the red glow of the flames against the darkness of the night, men poured from ramshackle buildings surrounding the warehouse and watched the fire. They knew the furs inside were lost. They knew that the cost of the damage would break many a trapper's heart. But they didn't know that inside the building,
Sergeant Preston lay bound and gagged, helpless in the face of certain death. Hey, all my furs are in there. Yeah, look at them flames. I'm going in there. You're local. If you do, you'll never get out alive. My warehouse. We're ruined. There ain't a chance in the world of saving anything. Laval, if that building caves in, we haven't a chance. Yes, and it's gone. My too. furs. Man, 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 listen to me. You better make good in them first, man. Yeah. What are you going to do about it, Pinch? Boys, I'm sorry. What about us? Pinch, we won't lose everything, will we? What Wait about a minute. Well, listen to me. You men all signed agreements with us. We agreed to pay when we ship the furs. If the furs aren't shipped, we don't pay. You mean I've lost a whole year's trap in that fire and I get nothing to show for it? I'm sorry, Hankins, but there's not a thing we can do about it. We lost the warehouse. There goes the building. <laughs> Well, Hankins, what was in that warehouse is just a hopeless loss now. You ought to give us at least a quarter of what our furs were worth, Vance. If we'd have taken them to Hudson Bay Company, we'd well, have Well, he didn't take them to the Hudson Bay Company. Why do you suppose you pay such high prices? We got competition to meet. We meet it the best way we know how, that's with highest prices. We don't allow a cent for any losses. You don't have to take a loss, Hankins. Preston. No, no, wait, I'm seeing things. How, how did that You're muddy... not seeing things, Duval, but you soon will be. The inside of a jail. Oh, that mutt, he must Yes, Vance, thanks to King here, I got out of that burning warehouse. He chewed through the ropes. Uh, what did you mean, Sergeant? You said I don't have to take no loss. I meant just what I said, Hankins. Your furs, together with the furs of the other trappers, are all safe in a cave about two miles from uh, here. Well, how big... Vance said... Vance you... and Duval are under arrest. You'll have to prove your story first, Monty. I'll prove it. Hankins, I'll take you to that cave where you'll find your furs. Well, it ain't no crime to put furs in the cave. And as for yourself, Monty, you can't Maybe prove... Maybe I can't we... prove you tried to kill me, Duvall. You have no charge, Preston, you know it. You can't prove we burned down our own warehouse. We didn't know the furs had been transferred to the cave. Someone else did it. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. We didn't know nothing about it. You have agreements with these trappers to pay them high prices when you ship. You agreed to those high prices because you didn't expect to pay them. But we'll make sure you ship now. And the law will see you stand by every word of your agreement. Sergeant, that contract gives them 30 days to ship. Don't worry, Hankins. They'll ship in 30 days, all right. And you'll have your money. <coughs> yes, King, the case is closed. <coughs> You are listening to Lone Green Challenge, an episode of Reimagined Radio, paying tribute to three radio programs that enjoyed a number of interesting connections. You just listened to Meeting the Terms of a Contract, an episode of The Challenge of the Yukon. J. Michael voiced the part of Sergeant Preston. This is John Barber. I'll be right back with concluding remarks after this short break. I'm John Barber, producer and host of Reimagined Radio. While I have your attention, let me remind you that Reimagined Radio is heard on local, regional, and international community radio stations. If you would like to support programs like Reimagined Radio, please contact your community radio station and learn how to donate. Every donation helps your station provide interesting and thought-provoking programs like Reimagined Radio. If you already support community radio through your generosity, thank you. If not, please consider supporting this and other community radio stations. Your support is valuable and much appreciated. With this episode of Reimagined Radio, we pay tribute to three radio programs, The Lone Ranger, The Green Hornet, and The Challenge of the Yukon. Each was produced and broadcast by WXYZ Radio in Detroit, Michigan, between the 1930s and the 1950s. The Lone Ranger was the first and was intended originally for younger audiences. But the adventures of the masked man, Tonto, and their two magnificent horses 
soon attracted a following of adult listeners. The success of The Lone Ranger led to a new adventure series, The Green Hornet, which copied much of its format and framework from the earlier series. The Lone Ranger and the Green Hornet also shared family connections. Brett Reed, young newspaper publisher, and secretly the Green Hornet, is the Lone Ranger's great nephew. Recall the Lone Ranger origin story. Captain Dan Reed, his younger brother John, and other Texas Rangers were ambushed at Bryant Gap by the Butch Cavendish Gang. Dan and John, when not on duty with the Rangers, shared a secret and very rich silver mine. Mortally wounded in the ambush, Dan Reed extracted a promise from John that if he survived, he would work the silver mine and share its riches with Dan's wife and young son, Dan Reed Jr. John Reed survived with the help of Tonto. As the Lone Ranger, John Reed cared for his nephew Dan, as he promised. Dan's son, Brett Reed, became the Green Hornet. In addition to family, there are other connections. Both the Lone Ranger and the Green Hornet wore masks. Both used non-lethal means for dealing with villains. But where the Lone Ranger had the magnificent horse Silver, the Green Hornet had Black Beauty, the fastest car in the world. The Challenge of the Yukon carried these components forward with Sergeant Preston dispatching claim jumpers, crooks, and bushwhackers with the help of his Black Horse Rex and Yukon King, the swiftest and strongest lead dog in the Northwest. In fact, the program was also known as Yukon King because the dog figured so prominently in many plots. Produced by George Trendle, owner of WXYZ Radio, and written by Fran Stryker, The Lone Ranger, The Green Hornet, and The Challenge of the Yukon are examples of pioneering radio storytelling. Through voices, music, and sound effects, we are there as The Lone Ranger, The Green Hornet, and Sergeant Preston keep the criminals in check. They each stand for something and never back away from their guiding principles. The larger-than-life characters, the adventurous plots, even the classical music themes have all contributed to making The Lone Ranger, The Green Hornet, and The Challenge of the Yukon among the best of all old-time radio programs. Script adaptations and dramaturgy for this episode of Reimagined Radio by John Barber. Music composition, sound design, and post-production by Mark Rose of Fuse. Our presence on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram is provided by Regina Carroll Social Media Management. Graphic design by Holly Slocum Design. Our announcer is Jack Armstrong. This is John Barber, producer and host. Thank you for listening. This has been a production of Reimagined Radio. Our radio broadcasts are heard on local, regional, and international community radio stations. For on-demand streaming, point your browsers to our website, Reimagined Radio. That's all one word, no punctuation, dot net. While you're there, subscribe to our snappy email program guide. Thank you so much for listening. And please join us again for another episode of Reimagined Radio, where we'll continue our exploration of radio storytelling. Thanks so much to John Barber and Reimagined Radio. We will have a quick intermission before we return with Tom Conkle and the Mindstream Players. Hi there. Are you a fan of all things horror? Yeah? You are? Well, in that case, find Tuesday Terrors, which is the mutual audio feed that comes out on a Tuesday, believe it or not. Shock horror, I know. But if you subscribe there, you'll find amazing horror fiction audio in your player every Tuesday. Yeah. Tuesday Terrors. Subscribe to the Mutual Audio Network. The Mutual Audio Network. 
listening and imagining together.